Okay, so we are recording, so I'm going to go ahead and get us started. So welcome, everyone. Thank you so much for being here. Um, this webinar is being hosted by the Public Knowledge Project, or PKP, and we'll be talking today about Plan S Compliance in Open Journal Systems, or OJS. My name is Kate Shuttleworth. I'm a librarian with Simon Fraser University, and I am based in the Vancouver area in Canada. And I'm here today with my, with my colleague Maria Maestrovska, who is a librarian at the University of Toronto Libraries, and we both also work with the Public Knowledge Project. So we're excited to be with you today to talk about the steps that journals can take to comply with Plan S requirements when using open journal systems. So just a note again, the webinar is being recorded and we also have auto captioning enabled. So you should see a caption option on your screen and uh, that should be something that you can toggle on and off um, using the toolbar in your Zoom menu. So I just want to briefly go over what we plan to discuss today in about the next 90 minutes. We will start by sharing a little bit of information about Plan S um, for folks that might not be too familiar. Um, but I did want to note that Maria and myself are not affiliated with Coalition S or Plan S. Um, we're certainly not representative of them, so we won't be able to comment on Plan S requirements or any compliance related decisions. Instead, our expertise is with using open journal systems. So the focus today and the majority of time will be on addressing specific Plan S requirements in OJS. We will end with some tips on where you can get further information, um, and we'll be talking throughout the webinar about that as well. PKP has lots of online documentation, um, various guides, and just generally lots of helpful resources. So we'll make sure that you know where you can find those, those things to, to help you along the way. If you do have questions, please go ahead and drop them in the Q&A. We will pause about halfway through um, the webinar. Maria and I will be switching speakers and um, changing the screen share over. So that will be a good opportunity to pause for some questions. And then of course, we'll have time at the end um, to cover any that we didn't get to. So feel free to ask questions anytime and we'll get to them um, in the middle and at the end. We also wanna draw your attention to a guide that complements this webinar. Um, produced by PKP, it's called the Plan S Compliance in OJS Guide. And we've put the URL on the slides here. So if you'd like to type this into your browser and get it open, um, you can follow along a bit with the webinar or have it for your later use um, as you're setting up some of the things we'll be talking about today in your own journal. So the URL is https colon slash slash tinyurl.com slash plan S OJS, all lowercase. So um, we will be covering a lot of the material that is in that guide today. You'll notice that some of the topics we'll be diving into could be covered in more depth. In fact, some could probably be a webinar on their own, but we have limited time today. So we'll be covering some things um, in not as much detail as you might need. So what you'll find is within the Plan S Compliance in OJS guide, there's links to additional resources and other guides that you can use. Um, to take you step-by-step step through some of the things we'll be discussing today. Um, I also wanted to point out that we'll be doing some live demonstrations today in a test journal in OJS. And the journal that we're using is in the latest, journal, the latest version of OJS, which is OJS 3.3. If you happen to be using an older version, you might notice that some features look different and some features might not be available at all. So we do recommend if you're able to, that you go ahead and upgrade your journal to the latest version, and that way you'll be able to take advantage of all of the features that we'll be covering today. So as I said, um, I'm going to just briefly introduce Plan S for folks that might not be too familiar with, with this already. Um, but I imagine many of you have likely heard of Plan S. Um, Plan S is an initiative to promote open access publishing for publicly funded research, and the plan is supported by major research funders from around the world. And together, those research funders are known as Coalition S. Plan S uh, was launched in 2018 and the requirements took effect in January, 2021. It requires that authors who conduct research that's funded by Co Coalition S funders publish in journals that meet the Plan S requirements. So those requirements for journals are what we will be covering today. The plan consists of 10 principles, and Plan S has provided guidance on the implementation of Plan S, as well as technical guidance and requirements. So that's all I'm going to cover today about Plan S, but I do suggest that um, you head over to the Plan S website if you'd like to learn more 
Um, the technical guidance and requirements that I mentioned are available here on their website. And the um, what we'll be covering today in terms of how to comply with these in, in OJS follows more or less um, what you'll find here on their website in terms of what those requirements are. So I will point you there to learn more about Plan S and their specific requirements. And now we'll focus on what this looks like in open journal systems. Um, so briefly, I'll just um, again draw your attention to the guide and tell you a bit more about it um, that PKP has produced that again sort of accompanies this webinar. Um, the guide provides specific guidance for OJS journals who are looking to ensure that they are complying with Plan S requirements. Um, as I said, it sort of follows more or less in order the Plan S technical guidance and requirements, and it also links out to relevant PKP documentation on specific topics. Um, and as I said, the webinar today will cover much of the same content as the guide, but the guide goes into a bit more detail and provi provides some additional links. We will be starting today with the criteria that are required by Plan S. And then later on, we'll talk about some of the criteria that are just recommended by Plan S. Okay, so with that, I wanna take us into our first set of requirements for Plan S um, that journals should be aware of. Um, and the first is just generally managing some policies in your, in your journal. So specific policies, of course, are set by individual journals. So we won't go into too much detail about what those policies will look like or what they will say beyond what Plan S uh, requires in terms of journal policies, but rather we want to look at where you might put this information in OJS um, and in specifically in the most recent version of OJS. Um, so we've grouped these policies roughly into two categories. The first is review and editorial policies, and the second is open access, copyright, and creative commons policies. So Plan S requires um, so again, certain types of policies and, and specifically they're looking for details about the type of peer review that the journal conducts, the publication frequency of the journal, some guidelines for authors, codes of ethics, which might include things like a statement on plagiarism and conflicts of interest, as well as editorial statistics that need to be published on the site. And we'll look at the statistics piece a bit more later on. Um, we do have, PKP does have a guide on journal policies and workflows as well. If you're looking for some more guidance on what these policies might look like, um, that's linked from the Plan S compliance guide as well. So there's a few different places you might place this information in your OJS site, and I will take us into the demo site to look at these in a moment. Um, but one place that journals quite often put these policies is in the field called About the Journal. And this is its own field in the dashboard, but it creates its own um, web page on the main navigation on your journal site. You might also want to have a separate um, web page and call it something like journal policies. So I'll show you how you can set up a custom page. For things like author guidelines, there's also a separate field in the system. Um, you'll find it in the workflow settings under submission. And again, I'll, I'll point that out in the demo demonstration journal. And for guidelines for reviewers, um, you might put that in the workflow settings under review settings. And then additionally, you might have a public statement about how review is conducted. And that could go in any of the fields mentioned here about the journal or a separate page. Um, so here I just have a couple of screenshots, but again, I'll take us into the live journal as well. Um, so this is a sample of an about the journal page. And what we've done is just created some headings for different types of policies the journal might have. Um, so for example, you can see the peer review process, the publication frequency, author guidelines that are all required by Plan S. Um, oh, my circle moved here, but this is an example of uh, review and editorial policies on a custom journal page. So instead of about the journal here, I've created a separate page in the navigation called it journal policies. And this just has the same information as you saw before on the about the journal page. Um, as I mentioned, in the workflow settings, there's a place for you to place author guidelines, and these get published on the submissions page on the site, so information for authors. And then information for reviewers can go in the review guidelines, and this gets seen by reviewers when they log into the journal after they've been asked to review. So the next set of policies I'll quickly cover are around open access, copyright, and creative commons. So for open access policies, um, the nature of your policy might vary somewhat depending on whether your journal is subscription-based or fully open access. 
Um, but in either case, journals must enable authors to publish with immediate and permanent open access without any kind of technical or other form of obstacles under an open license. So there I was just quoting from the Plan S requirements. So subscription journals, what this means is they must allow authors to self-archive the author accepted manuscript or the version of record in an open access repository at no extra cost and with no embargo. So there, there can't be a delay to making the work open in a repository. Um, and for open journals, this would mean publishing the work with an open license um, directly on the journal site. Uh, and in either case, or in both cases, the published article must be immediately available, open access, under an approved license. So I'll talk more about the open licenses in a moment. So that's whether it's published openly in the journal or placed in a repository with that license. So in both cases, journals should develop a transparent open access statement outlining these policies and place this on the journal website. Again, this could go in the about the journal page um, that we looked at earlier. It could have its own heading or it could go on a custom page with other journal policies or on its own page, uh, whatever the preference is. Another thing I'll note here, and this is a flag that this is just recommended by Plan S rather than required. It's recommended that journals register their policy around self-archiving. So for subscription journals, this would mean covering the requirements that I just mentioned, where authors are permitted to self-archive the version of record in an open access repository immediately upon publication. For open journals, um, they can have a self-archiving policy as well. This is often a straightforward policy since the work is already open. Some journals will even allow the published version um, of the work to be posted in a repository as long as the original publisher is acknowledged. So the tool that is recommended for registering this policy is called Sherpa Romeo. Um, it's a tool that authors can use to check the self-archiving policy of a particular journal. So when they're choosing where to publish, this might be one of the considerations. Um, so this is where Plan S recommends that journals place their self-archiving policy. So I'm just going to open it up here so you can see what it looks like briefly. And if we quickly search for an open journal, we can see the record that they have in the system. So they have their publisher policy, and then they have a separate policy for each version of the paper that can be deposited. It shows, for example, no embargo, the license that will be used, um, and the location where this work can be placed, in, for example, in an institutional repository, and then so on to the accepted version. Just to give you a sense of what that looks like. And on this side, I just have a screenshot of what we just looked at. So I'll just breeze through this. But again, just example of an open access journal self-archiving policy in Sherpa Romeo. And this is where, again, in your about on the, your about the journal page or wherever your journal policies are, you could place your open access statement under its own heading with some details about what this policy looks like. Again, depending on whether you're subscription or open access based, um, you might have different wording here. So the next piece of this is around copyright and creative commons. So Plan S requires that um, journals allow authors to retain their copyright at no additional cost. Um, Plan S also requires that open access journals use an open license for the articles they publish. So this license will give permission to the public to share and adapt the work for any purpose, including commercially, providing proper attribution is given, given to the author. And as we've heard for subscription journals, this means allowing authors to deposit their work in an open access repository, which uses one of these approved licenses. So Plan S does require Creative Commons, or sorry, recommends Creative Commons licensing to meet this requirement, but there are different types of open licenses that would fulfill this need as well. So what I want to do is just briefly, um, for folks who might not be too familiar with Creative Commons, just run through the licenses specifically that are um, allowed or required by Plan S um, because they don't allow every license. Um, so what I want to do here is actually open up this um, diagram. This is in one of PKP's guides um, that I mentioned earlier, the Journal Policies and Workflows Guide. So we have a section on choosing a license for your journal. 
Um, and this graphic can be quite helpful to demonstrate how the most open license is this one at the top that just requires attribution, but otherwise the work can be shared, um, distributed, remixed, and built upon, um, even commercially, as long as the original is credited. Um, so this is the most open license with Creative Commons, and it's the default license required by Plan S or allowed by Plan S. However, the share alike license is, is, always, is also allowed um, by Plan S. This is only slightly more restrictive than the attribution license. So you'll notice attribution is still required to the original creator. The difference here is that any new um, product that's created based on the original has to be shared with an identical license. So that Creative Commons license has to be used again if someone creates a reproduction. Going further down, um, I'll just I'll come back to this no derivatives one in a moment, but the non-commercial license is not permitted by Plan S. So this um, says that the work can be shared or reused, tweaked and built upon and so on, um, as long as credit is given to the author and the work is not used for commercial or, or profit purposes. Um, but this license is considered too restrictive under Plan S. Um, so it's not, it wouldn't be considered compliant. And the same with these ones we see further down, you'll see that non the non-commercial clause is included here, so neither of these are permitted either. The no derivatives license, however, is permitted on a case-by-case -case basis. Um, if there's a rationale for why it's needed, an author can get permission from their funder to publish using a no derivatives license. So what this means is, again, attribution is required, but in this case, the work can be redistributed exactly as it is, but it can't be modified or built upon it has to be changed, unchanged um, when it is redistributed or shared. So that license is sometimes allowed, but permission is needed. So just to recap from the slide here, the default license is the Creative Commons attribution, the most open license that, or I'll say the most, the most open that requires an attribution. There is a license that does not require attribution um, called CC0, and that is essentially um, dedicating the work as public domain. Um, so that would mean that the work could be distributed and shared without giving attribution or credit to the original creator. So that one is, I would say, less common. Um, most journals would go with the attribution license. The share alike um, is also allowed, where the work has to be shared again with the same license. The non-commercial license is not permitted, and the no derivatives license can be requested with justification for an individual article with permission granted by the funder. So what I'm sharing here on the right is just an example of how this license will look on a published article page. So you can see some copyright details, including the author owning the copyright. You can see the symbol that goes with this license, um, the name of the license, and this links to the Creative Commons website for more details. And then the description is just straight from the Creative Commons site. Um, and I'll show you where you would put this information just describing to readers of the work what they are allowed to do in terms of copying and redistributing the work according to this license. So there's essentially two audiences um, that will need to know this information about copyright and creative commons. So there's two distinct places that this information goes in OJS. And I'll, I'll show both of these in the demonstration in just a moment. But considering for authors, authors will need to know when they're submitting to the journal what will happen with their copyright, the, and in this case, um, for Plan S compliance, that they will be able to retain their copyright when they publish. And they'll need to know how their work will be distributed um, and what will be allowed in terms of it being distributed and shared by readers. So for authors, there's a field in the workflow settings, again, under the author guidelines that we looked at earlier, there's a spot for copyright notice for authors. And they'll see that when they submit. Readers also need this information because when they find an article on the site, they need to know who owns the copyright and how they can distribute and share and what they're allowed to do with the work that they're reading. So for readers, that information goes in the distribution settings. And again, there's a field for license that I'll point, I'll point to. Again, and then for open access journals, um, a third place that this Creative Commons license information needs to be is on the published article itself. So embedded in the PDF. Okay, so I'm going to take us in now to the sample journal so we can do a quick run through of these different policies we just looked at and where they might go. So here we are in our test journal and I want to start us off on the home page and just 
take us into the about the journal page that I've mentioned a few times. So this is where I've put some headings and laid out some of these policies um, around open access and things like this. And our statistics are down here. And then I also mentioned it's possible to put these policies on a separate custom page. So I've sampled that here and I'll show you where you would create that in the dashboard. And then the other piece I'll point to is on the submissions page. This is where we have our author guidelines and our copyright notice for authors. On if we head over to a published article, we can see the license and copyright details for readers that I mentioned as well. So I'm going to go ahead and take us into the dashboard. And um, so the first thing I'll take us to is the about the journal section. So that's in the journal settings. And just right here where it says description about the journal, this is where I went ahead and added some headings and put in my policy text. And I'll just point out you have um, the ribbon here for formatting, and you can also use HTML for formatting if you know some HTML. Um, next, I'm going to go to the workflow settings and have a look at the author guidelines. So under submission, we have our author guidelines. There's not much here, but this is where you would fill out more details for authors to know what is expected of them. And this goes on the submissions page that we just looked at. And then here's where you will put the copyright notice for authors to understand um, what will happen to their work when, when it's published, who has the copyright, and how can it be distributed and shared. I also just want to quickly point out in their workflow settings, here's where we have the reviewer guidance, guidelines or guidance. So here's where you can put some details for reviewers about what's expected of them, and they'll see this when they log in when they're asked to review. The next thing I want to show us is just how to create that custom page where we had the journal policies. So that will be here in the website settings under setup navigation. And we have our navigation menu items. We can go ahead and create a new item. I'll just call it new page. This will be a custom page. We'll just create the last part of the URL here. And then we can add some content. And click Save. So now we have our new page down here. And then to link it up to the navigation, I'm just going to go to the primary navigation menu and click Edit. Find the new page under Unassigned Menu Items and just drag and drop it over to Assigned. And I can choose where this goes, if it's nested under another menu item or if it's just a top level page and click Save. And now if I go back to our home page, I can see my new page in the navigation. So that's how I created that journal policies page. And then finally, under the distribution settings, this is where we can find that copyright information that, all, that readers will see. Um, and this gets this information gets saved into the, into the settings of the journal as well. So um, you can select your copyright holder again for Plan S, the copyright holder is the author. Select the Creative Commons license that the journal will use, and this CC attribution is the default for Plan S. Um, you can, you, there's some options here for the copyright year. And then here's where you can put the terms of the license. And I just pasted this directly from the Creative Commons website itself um, to describe to readers what they can do with the work under that license. And then that is the information that gets stamped onto that published article page that we saw at the beginning. Um, so to briefly return there, that this is what we just saw in the distribution settings. Okay, so I'm going to um, just whiz through these screenshots. I just had these here in case anything went wrong with the demo, but we just saw all of this. Um, so we've seen where the copyright notice goes in the workflow settings for in the author guidelines. We've seen how this appears on the submissions page on the public facing site. And we've seen in the distribution settings how we can set the copyright details with the author is copyright holder, the license, and the license terms. And we've seen the test, the sample um, article, published article, where we can see that license information stamped onto the published article page. OK, so a few more specific policies um, that are for open access journals in particular, um, according to Plan S. 
Journals, open access journals must be registered with the directory of open access journals or in the process of being registered in order to comply with PlanS. So um, PKP does have a guide for um, applying for, for inclusion in the DOAJ. It is quite a lengthy process, so we recommend getting started early um, and uh, really preparing your journal to make sure that you're meeting the criteria and the requirements of the DOAJ before submitting your application. Um, there is a cooling off period if you're unsuccessful with your application, so we recommend being quite thorough in checking that you are meeting those requirements. And another requirement for open access journals is it is not permitted for journals to have a mirror or a sister journal charging subscriptions. So what this means is where um, an open access journal exists, but then alongside it is a subscription journal that in many ways mirrors the um, specifics of that open access journal. So often it means the journal has a very similar title um, to the open access journal. It might have the same or a very similar editorial board, similar, similar policies, um, publish similar work and so on. So there, it's very similar to the hybrid model of publishing where a single journal publishes both subscription and open articles. In this case, you would have two separate journals that sort of mirror each other. And Planus does look out for this. Um, and it's it would discredit the open access journal from from being compliant with plan S if this was the case. Um, a few more things for open journals. So if your journal char charges article processing charges or any sort of publishing costs or fees, um, these fees must be transparent and available openly on the website. So um, a potential author should be able to find the fees before they submit. Um, PlanS also requires that journals um, provide waivers for article processing charges for certain um, authors and discounts for others. So there's some, again, I'll point you to the PlanS requirements themselves to see what this looks like. Um, but essentially for authors from certain low income countries, waivers and discounts are required by PlanS. Um, and they have specifics of, of what those countries are. Um, and the details about the options for applying for those waivers or discounts must be, again, available on the website and provided alongside the details about what those charges and fees are. Um, so I'll take us to the sample journal again to demonstrate this, but I just have a couple of screenshots about where you would go to waive that fee if you are a journal charging subscriptions. So essentially, when you reach the point um, where you are accepting the article and emailing the author to let them know the article has been accepted, so this is after peer review, um, you'll have the option to either charge the fee or waive it. And then there's also another place where you can do this at any time in the submission um, under the payments tab. So just to show you this in the journal itself, if we go to an article that is in review or reviews are completed and we go to accept the submission it will give us the choice here to request the fee or waive the fee and then at, at, as i say at any time up here in the payments tab we can also just click waived and then save so that's just how you would operationally do that um, if you're plan if you're charging subscriptions and you need to waive the fee um, as per plan s um, okay, so the next thing I'm going to talk about is a requirement by Plan S to publish journal statistics. So um, I'll talk through what those statistics are that are needed and where you might place them on the site, and most importantly, how you can find them in your in your journal in OJS. So Plan S asks for these statistics to be published annually and cover the number of submissions, the number of reviews that have been requested, and the number of reviews received the approval rate or acceptance rate, and the average time between submission and publication. So where you might put these statistics, it's really up to the journal, but for some suggestions, again, it could go on the About the Journal page under its own heading, or perhaps a separate editorial statistics page. Um, like I demonstrated earlier, you can create a custom page on the site for these. So I'm going to take us through where we can find each of these statistics in the system. And again, I'll go back to the journal to show us this. So the first one is the number of submissions received and the acceptance rate. So we're going to be heading over here under statistics to the editorial activity. And here we can filter by date. 
if we need to. So for example, we can say the last 90 days, the year to date, the last year or the last two years or a custom range. And this will give us the number of submissions received, the number of submissions accepted. And then of course, the difference between those two is down here under the acceptance rate. And this gives us the date range and the entire journal's history that, that what that rate looks like. Now for the number of reviews requested and received, we'll need to go to the review report and download that. So that will be here under reports. We would simply click review report and it will download into um, a spreadsheet on your computer. And then once you have it downloaded, you might need to alter the dates so you can get the date range that you're looking for in particular. Again, if it's annual statistics, you might just want your numbers for 2021. Um, so here you can see the number of items in the date notified column is going to give us the number of reviews that have been requested in that date range. So we'll simply highlight the column and see how many items are in that column to get um, the number of um, reviews that have been requested for various articles in that date range. And then similarly, looking for the number of reviews received, we'll look at the date completed column. So if there's no date, it means the review was not completed. So we can highlight this column and count how many dates are present, and that will give us the number of reviews that have been received. So finally, the average time between submission and publication. This one is a little bit um, tricky to do. So it involves downloading two separate reports and actually combining them. Um, so we recognize that this is um, a little bit inconvenient for journals. It would be ideal to have a single report um, that could give the, both the submission um, date and the publication date. So those dates could be compared. Um, but as of yet, we don't have a single report that contains both those dates. So um, I'll let folks know we have put in an active request um, to include the date published in the articles report. So that will be there alongside the date submitted so that it's easier to calculate the time difference between those two. Um, so this feature we're hoping will be developed for inclusion in later versions of OJS. So we'll, um, I advise you to keep your eye open for that feature. For now, um, I'll, I'll give you the workaround. So essentially you'll be looking at downloading both the articles report and the view report. So back in our journal, um, still under reports, we have the articles report here and the view report here. Download them both look for the date submitted column in the articles report and the date published um, column in the view report. The next step then is to combine those two columns into a single report. So there's instructions for how to do this online. For example, if you're using Excel, you can use the article ID as the common unique identifier that, com that then combines those two reports to make sure that you're aligning that those same articles um, with the same data. The result will be something like this. So you'll have a single spreadsheet with the date submitted and the date published. You can calculate the difference between these dates by taking the date published and minusing the date submitted. And this would be a basic formula in Excel, um, just this column minus this column will give you a calculation in days. You can then create an average from the dates, the days in this column. And of course, the um, result, the average that you're getting is in days, it might be more convenient to then convert it to, to weeks or months. Um, so that's essentially how you would get that statistic that can then be published on the journal site. Um, okay, another thing I will cover, I'm getting close to um, handing it off to Maria here, but a few more things to cover. Um, first of all, Plan S requires the use of persistent identifiers for articles preferably digital object identifiers. So um, a digital object identifier is a unique code that's assigned to an article, and it acts as a persistent link back to the article page. Um, and this, this uh, code, the DOI, is registered with an external agency, uh, for example, Crossref, you might have heard of. Um, so in order to set these up in the journal, a publisher will need a membership with a DOI registration agency. OJS assigns the DOIs, but then they need to be registered with that external agency um, where, the, where the membership exists. So this is what a DOI will look like on the published article page once, it, once it's set up. 
And clicking on that DOI will simply take you back to that article page. And as I said, it will provide a persistent link, always, always um, sending the user back to this particular article. Um, so the steps for setting up DOIs, um, the first thing a publisher would need to do is purchase a membership with a DOI registration agency. So examples are Crossref, already mentioned. There's also Datasite or Medra. Um, so this usually involves an annual membership. And there might also be content registration fees, so a, a small fee for each DOI that's registered. If your journal is affiliated with an institution, um, like a library or, or perhaps a consortium, um, they may already have a membership arrangement with one of these registration agencies, so you may be able to add your journal under their umbrella. So what will happen is uh, you purchase your membership and the agency will provide a DOI prefix, which can be used for all journals managed by that publisher. And you'll also receive a login and password, which you'll enter into the plugin in OJS. So you'll find the plugin, the relevant plugin um, in your journal, whether that's Crossref, Datasite, or Medra. Um, put in your credentials that you've received from the registration agency and check the automatic registration checkbox to enable DOIs to be registered when your issue is published. So OJS will do the registration on your behalf when you publish an issue. Um, one thing I want to point out is one of the requirements for DOIs under Plan S um, is that DOIs are available with versioning. So as of version, as of OJS version 3.2 and later, um, OJS supports article versioning. So that means that a new version of an article could be created and published and previous versions will remain accessible and they'll be clearly identified as having been superseded. So the DOI assigned to the article will always point to the most recent version of, the, of that article. Um, however, we do recommend you update the DOI metadata with a registration agency if you publish a new journal, or sorry, if you publish a new version, since um, the metadata might have changed and that agency might not pick up the changes right away. Um, okay, so I want to take us now into the journal um, to show what these settings look like. So we'll look at specifically the Crossref plugin. Um, because that's the one I have installed, but it looks very similar whether you're using Datasite or Medra. Um, so we'll look at where your credentials go and then how that is how that plugin is set up. So the first step would be um, to go to your website settings and look for the plugin. If it's not already installed, it should be in your plugin gallery for Crossref or uh, Medra or Datasite. Um, and then once it's installed, you can find this plugin under tools. So here I have the Crossref one and the data site one both installed. So I'm going to go into Crossref. And um, this is where I have my depositor information and then my username and password provided by that registration agency. And I've checked off the, um, the box that says OGS will deposit assigned DOIs automatically to Crossref. Um, a quick look at the settings so we can decide which objects will have that DOI assigned. We'll put in the prefix, again, provided by the registration agency, and this can be used by all journals that um, fall under that particular publisher. The DOI suffix, we usually recommend using the default. And then you can simply click Save. What will happen is, um, okay, I'll just take us to the Articles tab. So here we can see all articles that have been published already in the journal and their status in terms of their DOI having been deposited. So if the status shows they are not deposited, we can check off each article and click deposit, and that should send it on to that registration agency. Um, however, because we have the box selected for OJS to automatically assign the DOIs, we can also do this as we're publishing. So if I head over to a submission, I'll be able to go to the publication tab and go to identifiers, and then simply click assign and then save, and that will set up that DOI for that article. Then when I publish the issue, that DOI will be registered immediately with Crossref. Um, and then if that doesn't work, again, I could head back into the Crossref plugin and deposit manually. That's sort of available as a backup. Um, and then finally, um, as we already saw, we have our sample article with our DOI embedded on the page.
Okay, so that's a screenshot of what we just saw in terms of assigning the DUI. Okay, and then I think this is the last thing I'll be covering today. So just a note about article metadata. So Plan S um, has a requirement that journals have high quality article level metadata. Um, and this might sound a little bit vague, but we do have some guidance here on what this means um, and how to make sure that you're meeting this requirement. Um, so PKP has a metadata better practices guide. Um, so I would recommend, again, it's linked from the Plan S compliance guide. I'd recommend um, taking a look at this. And I've highlighted a few considerations just to give you examples, but there's lots to consider here. Um, so for example, making sure that the metadata or the information about an article that's published on the article PDF matches exactly the information that is inside the journal metadata fields. So for example, if there's a slight difference in the way the title is worded or a slight difference in an author's name between the PDF and the record in the system, that creates a discrepancy in the metadata that can cause issues downstream when that information is sent on to other, to other agencies such as Crossref. Um, using only one language per metadata field. So we do see this with some journals that are publishing in multiple languages. They're tempted to put um, their title, for example, in two languages, but both in the English language field. Again, that creates problems downstream. Um, it's confusing for the end user to see what the title is if it's combined in more than one language in the same field. Um, so we have solutions for this in terms of having a multilingual journal and having multiple title fields. So that again is available in the guide. Um, and then just reviewing article metadata prior to publishing, it is possible to make changes to metadata um, after publishing, but again, it can take time for that for those changes to catch up if the metadata has already been picked up by other agencies. Um, so ideally, making sure that those that everything is confirmed before publishing so those changes aren't needed. Um, and then a few specifics about the metadata required by Plan S. Um, so Plan S does require that information about funding for the research, specifically Coalition S funding, um, be published. So at a minimum, the name of the funder and the grant number or the identifier. So OJS has a plugin called the Funding Plugin um, that can request this information from authors when they submit um, and also publish it on the article page. And I won't go into this in too much detail right now because this will actually come up again um, when Maria is speaking. Um, we'll be talking about a requirement for persistent identifiers for funders, and so she'll demonstrate the plugin at that point. Um, Plan S also requires that um, metadata be in a standard, interoperable, non proprietary format. Um, and this is something that authors don't, or sorry, that journals don't really need to worry about when using Plan S. Uh, sorry, when using OJS, OJS metadata already meets this requirement. Um, OJS uses several different metadata standard, standards, um, and they all comply with this requirement for being interoper interoperable and non-proprietary. Um, so this is just something that OJS takes care of on your behalf. And then finally, Plan S requires article metadata to be released under a CC0 public domain dedication. So we suggest just adding a brief statement on your About the Journal page or somewhere else on the site that just um, specifies this in particular, that the metadata is available under CC0 license. So here I have an example of just placing this in the open access statement as a brief note at the end, article metadata is published under CC0 public domain dedication. Okay, so I am gonna pause here for questions and while we just switch over our screen share. Thank you, Kate. Um, we did receive a few questions. I'm going to read them out for you and for everyone's benefit. Uh, so the first question is pretty straightforward. Are we going to share this presentation? That is, uh, we can definitely answer that. Absolutely. So we plan to share both the slides and the recording from today's session. The recording will actually be added to the guide that we've been sharing um, on the slides. So the Plan S Compliance Guide will include the recording from the webinar. Thanks for asking that. Perfect. Another question is, uh, is PKP considering developing a plugin to automate the publication of editorial statistics? Also a really good question. Um, I have not heard of a plan to do this. Um, so at this point, the editorial statistics page is the best place to see the sort of quick find um, statistics. 
but it does not publish the statistics to the journal site. So um, I guess my answer is I don't know if there are plans underway. I haven't heard of any. It's certainly something we could bring forward um, or perhaps earmark for a sponsored development project if someone wanted to uh, to work with PKP on that. Thank you. Uh, another question. Uh, when publishing a new version, did you say that the DOI needs to be redeposited in the Crossref plugin? Uh, so just click deposit again or manually update metadata directly with Crossref? That's a good question. Um, and without sort of testing it, I, I have to say I don't know for sure. Maria, do you happen to know if you would need to redeposit? Yeah, uh, it's it's as simple as that. You just go to the Crossref plugin, you select that article again, and you just click deposit and the metadata will be updated. You do not need to do it on the Crossref end, although you certainly can if you're a glutton for punishment. <laughs> so we received a question that I'm not sure I understand. Uh, what has been the biggest challenge regarding the lead time of articles? If uh, the person who asked this question would like to add more details to help us understand it, then please um, go and submit another question and we will look at it then. Um, I'm going to now um, move us ahead into the second part of the presentation. Give me a moment to share my screen. Thanks, Maria. Can you confirm that my screen is visible? Yes, confirmed. Perfect. All right. Um, hi, everyone. Uh, for those who joined later, my name is Maria Maestrovska. I'm a digital publishing librarian at the University of Toronto, and I also work with PKP on a few projects, including documentation, in this case, LANES uh, Compliance and OJS documentation. So I am going to walk us through the remaining LANES requirements. And this one, preservation options, is actually the last one on the list of required um, items. Everything else after that will be um, recommended. So Planis requires that content be deposited to a long-term digital preservation or archiving platform. And to achieve that, OJS comes with a PKP preservation network plugin. Some of you may already be familiar with it. It is free to use for all OJS journals. Uh, you don't need to be paying for hosting or hosted by an institution. Um, you just need to have OJS version 3.1.2 and higher, and ISSN, and you need to have published at least one article. So I'm going to jump into our test journal just to show you how to enable it. Under our distribution settings and archiving in the PKP Preservation Network tab, you will need to check in the enable the PKP PN plugin check mark. Um, this is not the only thing you need to do. Additionally, you will need to go to plugin settings and agree to each point under the terms of use. If you already have published issues, they will get deposited into the preservation network after a while. So be prepared to be patient. It may take a few weeks to, for them to be picked up. And uh, newly published, issues will be deposited when they are published, once again with a bit of a delay. In order to check the preservation status, we will go to the plugin settings, that's under website plugins. I'm just going to do a search on page, that's the easiest way to get to the plugin I need here under PKPPN plugin. I'm going to look at the status. And in this grid, that's where the status of each issue's deposit will be reflected. Now, in addition to PKPPN plugin, there are a couple of alternative services, locks and clocks, and all of them, including PKPPN, work in the same way. They are dark archiving options, meaning that your journal's content will not become live until a trigger event that indicates that the journal is no longer publishing. In order to enable locks and clocks, you would also do it under the archiving tab. And just like PKPPN, uh, it's just a checkbox you need to check but you do need to have membership with those respective networks um, in order for this to work. And if you're curious, LOCKS stands for lots of copies 
keep stuff safe. That is the preservation approach where copies are distributed across a network of nodes that is maintained by different institutions. Portico is another um, archiving and preservation options. Um, just like locks and clocks, it requires membership and annual fees, uh, but it's a little different in the sense that the export happens through the Portico plugin. So the process actually is quite similar to the DOI registration through Crossref plugin that Kate just demonstrated. That is all I have to say about preservation options. If you have any questions, please put them in Q&A. I'm going to go ahead and move us along. And now we are going to be looking at recommended Plan S criteria. So everything from now and until the end of the presentation is not a requirement. One of the things Plan S recommends is using persistent identifiers for authors, funders, funding, programs and grants, and institutions. This is different from persistent identifiers for articles, such as DOIs, which were on the required list. For each of the persistent identifiers that PlanS wants us to use, authors, funders, and institutions, OGS has a corresponding plugin, and I will show you uh, how those work. So for authors, we have ORCID ID. Uh, many of you may already be familiar with what that is. It is an alphanumeric identifier that, um, uh, that serves to um, disambiguate author name variants or to bring together publications by the same author where the name may have changed. What ORCID plugin in OJS does specifically is it um, shows the ORCID ID next to the author's name on the published article page. It allows um, editors to request uh, ORCID authorization from authors and contributors, or it can send automatic requests and when a new user creates an account with OJS, it allows them to log in with their ORCID ID and pull some information from their ORCID record, such as their name and affiliation, depending on um, what information they made public in their ORCID record. Now, all of that you can use with the free public API. There are additional functions that you can use with a member API that does require payment and member API may be available to you through your institution or through your provincial or national consortium. For example, here in Canada, where we are, we have ORCID CA consortium that negotiates better membership prices for consortium members. Obtaining the credentials and using ORCID ID plugin is spelled out in much detail in our ORCID ID plugin guide, which is also linked from the PlanS compliance in OJS guide, but I'm going to just show you briefly where all of that lives in OJS. So I am here in my plugins menu under website settings, plugins, and uh, this is my ORCID profile plugin. In order to enable it, if you're doing it for the first time, you need to already have um, your API credentials. OJS will not allow you to enable it if you do not have the credentials. So here are my credentials. And um, I've also added my geographical location to help with reviewer information. And this is where I can um, set the system to automatically send out authorization invites after the article has been accepted and sent for copy editing. And if I go to my test submission, here um, is my submission with all the IDs. And I look at my contributor details. The ORCID ID for the contributor lives here. Uh, the link is active and there is a little green icon next to it. It means that it has been authenticated. But if there is no link here, I can scroll down to the ORCID section and check the checkbox, send email to request ORCID authorization, click save, and my contributor will receive an email with a link that invites them to authenticate their ORCID ID. And when the article is published, I'm just going to preview. Their ID will be displayed next to their name. And if I click on that ID, it will take me to their ORCID record. In this case, this is just a sandbox. So uh, there isn't much here. But in real life, that would be their ORCID record. All right, that's all I have to say about ORCID. Now I'm going to move on to talking about persistent identifiers for organizations. 
Uh, and this is achieved through the ROAR registry. ROAR is the Research Organization Registry. It's a community-led registry of unique identifiers for every or almost every institution organization in the world. Uh, the ROAR plugin is available for OGS 3.2 and higher. And what it does is it displays contributors for affiliation on the article page. So here you see that the University of Toronto affiliation has a little ROAR logo next to it. And if I clicked on it, it will take me to the University of Toronto record in the ROAR registry that has the official name and all affiliated organizations as well as other identifiers. So the benefit of um, using the registry is that you avoid typing in different variations of the same institution's name. And if I go back to my submission, just to show you where it is, once again, it's under my um, uh, under my contributor details and. Um, here, normally, your affiliation only um, has one field where you would free type the name of the institution. But once um, you have the ROAR plugin enabled, you can look up the institution's name and pull the official name from uh, the registry. So, for example, I'm going to type University of Bern. It looked it up, it found it. If I click on it, it adds the um, uh, official standardized name as well as the um, uh, as well as the raw number uh, and um, I saw a question in the chat and I didn't um, uh, sorry in the Q and A and I didn't answer it um, right away because uh, I was curious as well how to add multiple affiliations. I was curious whether a raw plugin can achieve that. Uh, and uh, to be honest, I'm not actually sure. Um, I'm kind of like live testing here right now. So this is something I would need to test in order to be able to answer. But for now, if we were to enter this and save, it would be reflected on our um, published page right here. All right. I'm going to look it up afterwards, I promise. Now, um, moving ahead to our persistent identifiers for funders. Um, that is the funding plugin that Kate mentioned before, and now I'm going to show it in a bit more detail. It um, pulls funding data from the Crossref registry, where funders have DOIs, much like articles do. Uh, both authors can add funding information when they first submit the article as well as editors can add it later and um, the funding data will be displayed on the published article page. So once again, let's take a look um, at our article. Once I have the funding plugin enabled, it adds this funding data tab under my publication section. And if I go there, that is where I will see the information that author entered when they made the submission, and I can edit it or delete. As well, I can enter funder data myself. For example, I'm going to enter SHRC. This is uh, one of the Canadian federal funders. And I um, can enter grant members. So if I want to add multiple, I just need to um, add a comma and um, add multiple grant members, save. And when I go to preview, um, both of those will be displayed here under funding data on my um, article page. And if I click on the link, it will take me to Crossref's record for that funder. It will display all of the other publications uh, or research outputs that were tagged by them. I'm not going to do it now because it takes a long time to load the remaining um, submissions there. And I just wanted to show you what it looks like for an author. So obviously, as an editor, you might not know what uh, funder they were with and what grant number they um, want to associate the publication with. So you probably want the author to enter this information. So if I go to a submission as an author, this is what it will look like. I'm just going to blast through this uh, just to get us to the metadata section. Oh, 
same continuum we're going to upload a file. So this is our metadata section. Normally you would enter title and abstract and contributors as usual. And you will notice that now we have this funding data section here added by the um, added by the funding data plugin, sorry. And this is where the author will be able to enter the funder, look them up, enter the grant numbers, etc. All right, that is all I have to say about the funding plugin. Uh, if you have questions about that, please put them in the Q&A. And I'm going to move ahead to the next recommended uh, criterion for Planes, which is uh, full text JATS XML publishing. This is one of those topics that could be a workshop or a series of workshops on their own, so I'm definitely not going to cover it in full. Uh, what I'm going to say briefly is that just like with other um, format publishing in OJS, the formatting of your um, article usually takes place outside of OJS. So you would get to the point where you are past copy editing and you're ready to send your article for layout editing and typesetting. You would take that file from your editorial workflow in OJS, send it to your typesetter. And when you are ready, uh, when the file is laid out and you have your XML file, you would upload it back as a galley. So here in my test submission, under galleys, I have added an XML galley and I uploaded a file that I just grabbed from a journal that publishes in XML. And when I go to preview, it is displayed next to my other galleys. And when I click on it, the XML viewer actually takes that XML file and displays it as HTML for, uh, for the viewer's sake. Uh, and I believe this was prepared by a professional typesetter. Now, the question that we see quite often is, is there some kind of a tool or an application where I can take my um, copy edited manuscript put it in and it will produce um, a JATS XML that is production ready on the other end. And this has been on the uh, roadmap for PKP for a long time and there have been a few projects that were started and then they had to be put back on the shelf because the underlying open source code for those projects stopped being maintained by their own developers. Unfortunately, that is what happens in open source reality every now and then. So there are a number of tools, but a lot of them are in beta. So they're not at the stage where I would be able to recommend them. Um, if uh, a journal wants to use those tools or a combination of those tools, uh, it is expected that they would need some level of technical expertise and that there may be some technical issues that they would need to troubleshoot themselves. So if you're interested in checking out those tools and seeing if any of them work for you, uh, this who is who in JATS report uh, from 2019 has been prepared by um, PKP partners. And uh, once again, it is linked from, from the Plan S compliance and OJS guide. And uh, yes, you, you can uh, take a look and explore this further. All right, so the next uh, couple criteria from Planes that are also recommended, I put them both on the same slide because they both have to do with the same um, kind of general concept of sharing your journal's content with other repositories and indexes. The first one um, has to do with Planes's recommendation to allow direct deposition of publications by the publisher into often designated or centralized open access repositories that fulfill the Planes criteria. So OJS uh, addresses that in just a very specific way. Um, and that has to do with um, the SORD protocol. SORD protocol uh, facilitates metadata and full text exchange between repositories. So if you have an OJS journal and there is a repository that supports SORD, such as DSpace-based repositories, then you can automatically set up deposits from your OJS instance into that repository. Uh, SORT plugin is available for OGS 3.1 and 3.2, and you can read more about it in the SORT plugins um, GitHub page, which once again is linked from the Plan S compliance and OGS guide. 
Another thing that has to do with exchange of your data um, is Planis' recommendation for journals to be compliant with open air guidelines for literature repository managers. This involves uh, providing your metadata in a specific format to be harvested by the open air infrastructure. For those of you who don't know, open air is a European initiative that collects and shares metadata and funding data about open access publications. So uh, open air does not need your full text articles. It only wants your metadata. It will link back out to your journal for full text. And it wants metadata in the specific format, OAI Open Air JATS, that is delivered through OAI Pay Image. It means that this is a passive harvesting. You will not need to do any exports. Once you have it all set up, the metadata will be harvested from your journal, and um, you won't need to do anything else. So what the Open Air plugin for OGS does is it adds this format to your OAI Pay Image feed. It adds core resource type vocabulary to your journal section details. And this is where our funding plugin comes in for the third time, because if you use the funding plugin, then the funder information will also be added to your feed and delivered to Open Air. So let me show you where all of that lives and how to set it up. So first of all, we need to make sure that our OEI PMH feed is enabled, and we can check this under distribution, access, enable OEI, check that it is enabled. I believe it is enabled by default. And if you also want to see what your OEI feed looks like, you can just add OEI at the end of your journal URL, and it will take you straight there. And under metadata formats, you can also see the different formats in which your feed is provided. Here is our OEI Open Air JADS that is added by our Open Air plugin because I already have the plugin enabled. Now, if you're wondering why this looks so terrible uh, and not at all user friendly, that's because this format is for machines to talk to one another and to exchange data between them. So chances are you will not need to look at it again. So another thing I mentioned that the plugin does is it adds core resource type vocabulary to your journal sections. So under sections, if you go to edit, you will see that there is this drop down now that allows you to select which of these vocabulary um, resource types corresponds to your journal section, and it will be included in your open air feed. So after you set all of that up, Obviously, the key thing here to do is to actually tell Open Air that you want them to harvest you. And how to register with Open Air is covered in detail in the Open Air plugin guide. All right, we're close to the end. I think I only have two left. Uh, another recommendation by Plan S is to link to uh, available research data that um, corresponds to the um, scholarly article that your journal is publishing. It is very easy to achieve in OJS by using a remote galley. So let me show you how it's done. Uh, I'm going to go into my test submission again. And I'm going to go to galleys. So this is where I created a galley that I called data, but I'm not going to upload my data into OJS. I could if I wanted to upload it as a supplementary file, but maybe you don't want to because it is too large. Maybe you want it to reside in a data specific repository that has more uh, data specific functionality. So in that case, you can check the checkbox that says this galley will be available at a separate website and then link that website. So in my case, I'm linking the data set in Zenodo. And when I go to preview, this galley will be displayed alongside other galleys. And if I click on it, it will take me out to that data set in Zenodo. Now, there is also a uh, plugin in development that will allow authors to deposit data into a Dataverse repository upon submission. Uh, so keep an eye out on it. And finally, I believe this is the last on my list. Planus recommends that journals provide open citation data in a way that is shareable, freely accessible, and reusable according to the standards by the Initiative for Open Citations. 
So if your journal is open access, it does not automatically mean that your citations are open or can be reused by others. So there are a few additional steps you will need to take. Crossref manages citations through their cited by service. If you already are a Crossref member, then using the service is free for members and it is also optional. So Crossref will not actually force you to it. Since 2017, all new members references are open by default. But if you joined Crossref before 2017, you will need to check whether your journal's references are set to open. And Crossref does have lists where you can check that. Uh, and if it's not open, then you can request with Crossref that they open your citations. Now, of course, in order for someone to be able to reuse those citations and also for Crossref to be able to collect the site and buy statistics, you will want to actually send your references to Crossref. And in order to do that, you can use the Crossref reference linking plugin. So let me show you how that works. In order to use this plugin, we will need to do two things. First of all, we're going to enable the plugin and it lives under all of our plugins. Here, reference linking, you just need to enable it. The uh, settings uh, tell you uh, what is going to happen, but there isn't actually anything you need to set up. And very importantly, in order for this plugin to work, you need to have your references in a separate metadata field. So under our workflow, metadata are multiple fields that we can enable or disable that are offered to authors when they start a submission. And one of those fields is references. So once you check the checkbox, enable references metadata, you can determine whether you want them to be optional for authors or whether you want them to be mandatory. Making them mandatory means that authors will not be able to proceed with their submission without putting their references in that reference box. So essentially, they would need to copy the references from the article into the reference text box in the metadata submission screen. And later on, when the article um, is going through all of its normal course, as editors, you can also check those references and uh, you can make sure that they were entered appropriately. So here under publication references is where I copied and pasted my references from the article. Now what will happen when the plugin is running, once your article is published, these references will be sent to Crossref and Crossref will check them against their database of references. And if they already know DOIs for those, they will return those DOIs. So on your published article page, you will have the reference list with the respective DOIs. I didn't actually register this, this is just my tab journal, but that is what it will look like. Um, all right, I believe this is it. Um, we have links here, and these are also the links that um, you can find under the uh, Planners Compliance and OJS guide. So links to the guide itself, to PKP documentation, and to PKP community forum, all excellent resources to help you with your Planners Compliance, as well as with general management and use of OJS. And now um, we're going to open it up for questions again. If you've been holding off and waiting to ask your questions, now is the time to put them in the Q&A. Thanks so much, Maria. So we did have a couple of questions come in. One I answered um, just by typing. Um, the person says, this is a really amazing webinar. Thank you so much. Uh, will we be able to get access to the recording and will you be hosting more of these in the future? So. Um, I said, thank you. Yes, we'll be adding the webinar recording to the Plan S Compliance and OJS guide, so it will be available publicly. And we do hope to offer more webinars in the future. If you have suggestions for topics, feel free to send them via our contact form. So I put the link in my response there. Um, but if you, if you go to the PKP website, you can just find the contact us page. And there's a form there that you're welcome to fill in if you'd like to suggest a topic that you'd like to see for a future webinar. Um, and then we have a question about ORCID. Um, so I actually haven't heard of this bug before, but um, that's not to say that others haven't experienced the same thing. So they're saying, at our journal, often an author receives the email to validate their ORCID 
And when they click the link, they receive an email to say that verification has failed. And yet when we check the submission, it seems to have worked. Is this a known error with the ORCID plugin? I have seen this happen. Um, and um, it's hard to say without looking specifically at the journal, but I, I think I know which issue it was, and I believe it was resolved in newer versions of ORCID. So make sure that your ORCID plugin is updated to the latest version, uh, and um, hopefully that will help. If you still continue to experience this issue, please feel welcome to post on our PKP community support forum, uh, developers monitor, monitor that forum, including ORCID developer, ORCID plugin developer, so they will be able to help. Perfect. Thanks, Maria. Um, and then a question about references. What happens if the references that the author inserts at submission need to be changed throughout the peer review process? So if you're talking about that reference, um, uh, the um, metadata field with references, uh, those can be changed anytime. So if, if we're talking simply about the logistics of changing a reference, um, then that is pretty easy to do. So you would uh, you can just uh, do it here under references, change it and save. Now, of course, this is something that you would want to coordinate with the author, right? Uh, if they have indicated that a reference needs to be changed, what does that mean for the publication? If, if that public if that reference was kind of one of the one of the bigger underlying um, pieces of information that they used to structure their article around, and then they suddenly they want to change that. This is this we are kind of moving more into the publication ethics and how you would um, approach that. But logistically, yes, you can just change them here. Perfect. Thank you. Um, a few uh, folks saying that they enjoyed the webinar, so that's really great to hear. Thank you so much. Um, okay, this is um, a question about distribution settings and copyright and licensing. So in the OJS distribution settings, so this might be one um, for me to answer, Maria. In the OJS distribution settings under license, I don't understand how you could have the copyright holder set to journal and also have checked a Creative Commons license. My understanding is that a CC license includes the attribution part of part to the author that, if I'm not correct, can't be transferred to the journal. Only the distribution part can be transferred, right? I would have thought only the author can set dispositions for attribution since this part belongs to them. Um, so it's an interesting question. So I guess I'll just return to one of the requirements of Plan S actually is that authors retain copyright. So this, this might just clear up this question. Um, the journal is not permitted to retain copyright according to Plan S requirements. However, I would say Creative Commons can apply regardless of who owns the copyright. They are two distinct things. So if the journal did retain copyright, um, they actually could set a Creative Commons license. Um, Creative Commons is just showing how a reader can reuse the work. Um, and they have to give credit to the to the original author, regardless of actually who has that copyright. So um, those two are not at odds with one another. You can have a case where a journal has copyright and they are still using that Creative Commons license. I hope that helps answer the question. Um, and then finally, will the DOI link to Crossref need to be updated when the references are updated? So if, if the question is about the DOI of an article, and then if you update the references to that article, then the DOI link will not change. The DOI is assigned at the point when um, the article goes through the workflow and it is comprised of the, um, of the structure that you have entered into your DOI plugin. Um, but if you have changed, if you have sent your references to Crossref already. So you published your article, you're using the Crossref reference linking plugin, your references have been um, sent to Crossref and then returned with DOIs. And then you go to change them. So maybe you need to unpublish your article, make the changes, publish it again. Then yes, you would want to update your metadata with Crossref. So just like any changes that happen after your DOI has been registered, you will want to go into your Crossref um, uh, XML export plugin and just 
click deposit again. This will not change the DOI link, but it will send updated metadata to Crossref. Thanks, Maria. And the last question I was actually just trying to look for an answer to myself. Um, is there a database of Plan S compliant journals? I believe um, Plan S has a tool. Let me just jump to the Plan S guide. We have under relevant resources. So they have this uh, journal checker tool for Plan S compliance. Um, I am not sure that it, it is it is a database. Um, per se. They also have Planus Compliance Service. I have to be honest, I do not know much about those. I have linked the um, release announcements here. So you can take a look and see if they meet um, your needs in terms of what, what you're looking for. But I think that's the closest to what I know they have. I did find a journal checker tool on the Planus site. Is that one of the um, yeah. resources there? Uh, okay, perfect. Yes, yeah. this is one of those. Yeah, exactly. Okay. So it looks like that's what's available right now. Thank you everyone for your questions. We do have about seven minutes left. If there are any further questions, we're happy to stick around and answer those. And otherwise, um, thank you so much for taking your time today and joining us. Um, really nice to see folks here and um, we hope to see you again. Thank you everyone for your time. And as we promised, the recording will be made available uh, and linked as part of the Plan S uh, Compliance and OJS Guide.